I posted something on social media the other day, which basically said that every business is sellable. It's just a matter of what it's worth to the buyer and what it's worth for you to go through that sale process. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I've got a question for you. Have you considered wholesale? Are you selling wholesale? Have you had issues with wholesale? Are you scared? Are you nervous? Do you not know what the heck you're doing with wholesale? If you answered yes to any of those questions, I would love to help you navigate wholesale because guess what? It doesn't have to be hard. And as much as you know that I am the bundle queen and I love bundles and bundles is how I have made the bulk of my revenue and profit and income. I'm not going to force you into bundling either, but I am going to encourage you to do wholesale if you haven't tried it already, because no matter if you're doing arbitrage or thrifting, or you have 512 brands of your specific private label product. Wholesale is still a really important process. You are a retailer and retailers, whether on and offline, they know how to navigate wholesale. And if it's just something that makes you nervous or uncomfortable, or you've been burned or you're scared, or you just am like, I would love to, but I have no idea what to do. I am going to invite you now to join me for the intro to wholesale experience that we have coming up. It's different than our wholesale bundler workshops, but it's an event that I do a couple times a year in a couple different locations. And if you go to mommyincome.com slash workshop, you're going to be able to see the details about starting wholesale. Because honestly, if you're ready to start wholesale, there's a few spots left in the trade show experience that is coming up in Grand Rapids. It's literally next week. It is one day and not even a full day of just learning how to wholesale, learning how to talk to vendors, learning how to even get catalogs, get set up and get started with selling wholesale products. You're not committed to anything, but you're committed to learning the process so that the next time you want to set up a, an account with a vendor or you have questions, you are going to be confident and ready to handle those discussions. So I would love to be able to do this with you. Um, not Bundles isn't always for everyone. And so if you really want to just start out with wholesale, I've got this wonderful experience for you, what you're going to get is the intro to wholesale course as well as some some mommy income swag and a personal trade show walkthrough with me um, with a, a small group of people say three or four people max um, because we want to get the best experience possible we're going to talk to vendors we're going to ask questions we're going to have these uncomfortable conversations so that we can get started with selling wholesale i'm telling you it's going to change your business and i would love for you to go with me on that so go to mommyincome.com slash workshop and in order to check out the uh, trade show walkthrough experience, because we have a couple of those on the calendar. And we also have a couple of real confident wholesale bundlers workshops coming up uh, this year. So you want to make sure you check out that workshop page, mommyincome.com slash workshop. And I would love to be able to just do this with you in person, literally hold your hand, walk next to you, have the conversations, you have the conversations so that you can walk away confident knowing I've got this wholesale thing. I really want that to be your mantra for this year. So if you're excited and you're in the area and want to come to Grand Rapids, or if you're not in the area and you want to come to Grand Rapids, we do a VIP party the night before where we have dinner and drinks and we have conversation and we just get to know each other. And then the next day we dive into wholesale. We have the conversations, we have workbooks and downloads and a course that you can watch, a mini course. It's not going to take you but an hour or less to go through this mini wholesale course, but I promise you, you are going to benefit immensely. Wholesale does not have to be hard. It just has to be done correctly. And there are certain things that you need to do, but they're not hard. You can do this. I believe in you and I want to do it with you. If you need more confidence, mommyincome.com slash workshop. That's all. I'd love to do wholesale with you. Now let's get to our episode today because today we have a guest. His name is Joe Valley and he is from Quiet Light Brokerage and he has sold, get this you guys, he has had his hand in buying, selling over a billion dollars of business, businesses online, sold them. And he has helped so many people exit their business when they're ready. So you might be building your business right now and you're like, exit, I don't wanna think about exiting and selling, I just started. But eventually you might wanna retire. Eventually you might wanna pivot. Eventually you might just 
find something else that interests you. And you're going to say, Hey, this business has been great, but I'm done with it and like to move on to something else. So this is where you want to be able to continually set up and maintain your business so that if, and when you decide to exit, you can, it can be a slam dunk for you. And so that's why I have experts like Joe come on the show to talk about his own journey with building up, buying and selling businesses and how you can best set up and maintain your business so that when you're ready for exit, it can literally be a very streamlined process. So welcome Joe to the show. Oh, and I forgot to tell you before Joe comes back on, he's also an author. He wrote the Exitpreneur's Playbook. So you want to make sure you go to Amazon and go to uh, the e Exitpreneur's Playbook. There's also a link below this video to get that book. Um, he's had an incredible experience with buying, selling, setting up businesses, um, and he is just ready to dive in. So without further ado, Joe, welcome to the show. So welcome, Joe, to the show. Thanks for coming on. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. So tell us first and foremost, what was your very first entrepreneurial experience? Oh, we don't want to go back to my worm farm or paperboy days, probably. You mean probably as an adult, right? I, I suppose you can start at the one as a kid. I think people that are entrepreneurs have oftentimes had, like you said, a paper route or something like that when they were younger and it just okay. kind of was born into them. We'll do the quick one when I was, I lived on Central Street in Gardner, Maine growing up. And at, I don't, where are you from? Where in the world Michigan. are you? You're in Michigan. All right. So you got good dirt up there. Up in Maine, if you go outside at night with a flashlight and you flash, you know, a flashlight on the ground, you'll see night crawlers. And then they, as soon as you get too close, they feel the vibration, they go right back into the ground. Well, in Maine, if you look at the map, it's surrounded by water, which my hometown was. So I used to go out and catch night crawlers at night and put a sign up on the tree out front, night crawlers for sale. So uh, I, I say in my book, that was my first experience, my, my muddy grasp on supply and demand. I used to sell night crawlers to fishermen. Fast forward to actually being an adult. And I mean, I tried many things, but I, I worked for a company I joined in 1994, uh, where we did 17 million in revenue that year. When I left in 1997, we did 105 million. Oddly enough, the founder of that company lost money when he did 105 million. He made money when he did 17 million. But I left that company uh, to start my own media buying agency. And I left that company because it was awesome once upon a time where it had a real entrepreneurial vibe, which I needed. And then it got too big and I felt like a worker bee. Uh, so I left to join, uh, to start my own company called JBI Media, which was a media buying agency. Much like people run PPC agencies now, I did it on radio back in the day, 1997. And my goal in 1998 was to make $50,000. Before downsizing at this other company, Talk America, that was my salary. They downsized everybody and I made 35. So I'm go out on my own and make 50,000. And lo and behold, I made 10 times that. And I thought this entrepreneurial thing is pretty cool. I like it. Uh, of course, you know, as most entrepreneurs experience, if they've been doing it long enough, they have carry forward losses. So I didn't make a profit every year, but I, I had a great start to my entrepreneurial venture back in 1997. Been self-employed ever since. And have you done any sort of like, okay, so how did you break into the e-commerce world? Were you ever part of an e-commerce world? Did you own an Amazon yeah. store, yeah, Etsy yeah. store? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that uh, media buying agency, I bought time on radio for radio direct response clients, right? I moved uh, very quickly into launching my own products. In 1998, I launched my first brand and then I let that run its course launched another one with some partners. And in 2002, I launched my last uh, one on radio and then did a television infomercial like my previous one. And I took it 100% online in 2005. And from 2005 to 2010, it was a pure uh, e-commerce business. Uh, I took it through the best of and the worst of the economy, right? 05 to 07, things were amazing. 08, 09, 10, pretty rough. Um, and I wrote good quality content. Google paid, re rewarded me with great organic rankings, but I also did pay-per-click uh, advertising with Google and Bing and, and the like. Um, but that came out of that five-year stretch, tired and worn out, woke up one day and said, I wonder if I can sell this thing. I didn't 
plan it necessarily. I just woke up and needed to move on as an entrepreneur, as we often do. And I reached out to three different brokerage firms at the time. Two were just trying to get their hooks into me for a commission. The third said, listen, if you do this, that, and this, you'll make another hundred grand, but you got to wait six months to make that work. And I thought, who the hell, who the hell is this guy telling me to wait six months, giving me advice that was in my own best interest? Of course, I took that advice. That guy's name was Mark Doust. He's now my business partner at Quiet Light Brokerage. So I sold my last e-commerce business in late 2010, took 2011 off, joined the company in 2012 when it was just Mark Jason, who was the original uh, entrepreneur turned advisor. And then I joined. So it was the three of us very quickly. Amanda joined. Now we've got a team of 15 advisors, about 10 support staff. We closed just under $250 million in total transactions in 2021, all, all online business transactions. That is so interesting how you went from these companies that are just like, sure, we'll sell your business and we want to get this commission to um, this guy who then, uh, of course, now is your partner who says, well, if you clean up your business a little and you do this and you make this change and you wait six months, you could get you know, so much more for your business. And that's, I think, really what the topic of discussion today really is, because there's a lot of people out there, of course, as entrepreneurs, um, we seem to have a short attention spans, whether that's three years, five five years, 10 years, we're always wanting to pivot and change, not only with the times, but also with, you know, in, in our business, we have different changes that we like, different hobbies or different things that we're into. And we want to pivot out of that. So what are the first couple of things that people can, can do within their business to see, first of all, is it saleable at all? Is there a checklist? Is there something that, that we can start at the top and go from the bottom to say, how do I even know if my business is sellable or not? Yeah. So I posted something on social media the other day, which basically said that every business is sellable. It's just a matter of what it's worth to the buyer and what it's worth for you to go through that sale process. Uh, but the first thing people really have to do is, A, understand that what they have is probably sellable. B, many cases, if it's a business that's growing and it's two, three years old, odds are it's your greatest asset in terms of your net worth, and you should know how much it's worth. C, set a goal. Okay, but let's start with that. These businesses are sellable, so therefore you want to sell it someday, right? It may be a decade from now. You may want to pass it on to your children or your neighbor, whatever the case might be, but you should set a goal in terms of dollars. How much do you want to sell it for? When do you want to sell it? And Kristen, how do you want to feel when you sell it, right? That's a really important part of it because we all have rough days as entrepreneurs. So when you set that goal of, I want to sell my business for a million dollars in the third quarter of 2023. And when I do, I want to feel amazing because I'm going to take six months off and go RVing with my family. Then you have hey, to read. <laughs> Are you in my head? Did you like read what I plan on doing in the next couple of years? That's there you go. About right. <laughs> That's perfect, right? That's what we yeah. all want to do. Now you have to reverse engineer a path to that. How close or how far you are to that, in this case, million dollar exit and add or subtract zeros or numbers to suit you and your business goals. So, you know, if you reverse engineer a path to that, that means you have to figure out what the value of your business is today. And you can go about that in a variety of different ways. Some are better than others. You can pick up the book that we're going to talk about that I just wrote, and that'll get you 70% of the way there, but it's, you're a blue belt, you're not a black belt. Um, my advice is, is really to get a full valuation of your business. It's free. You can use our firm, Quiet Light, or any firm that you have a relationship. They'll help you understand where you're at today and what levers you can push or pull to improve the value from a buyer's perspective to make sure that you're going to you know, accelerate your path to that exit. You know, I will say that I have used Quiet Light to have not one, but two business evaluations so far. And it's been my favorite process because of what you described there. I, I didn't feel like someone was trying to sell something to me. I really felt like, you know, the whoever, I can't exactly remember the person I spoke to at that moment, but like, cause it's been a year or more. Um, but I just remember the process being like more about those things, the goals. How do you want to feel? And where are you now? Just filling in the gaps. So even if you want to sell your business for $10 million. That's certainly a goal that you can have, but filling in the gaps is really what Quiet Light helped me realize when I was like, okay, this is about what it's worth here. And I did learn some things in there. I want to hear straight from the horse's mouth here is um, some of the assets. What, what is making in today's FBA business world, um, what is making businesses appear more 
um, more favorable? What are buyers paying more for? Is it specific assets? Is it specific types of sourcing? Like what is sweetening the deal when it comes to the assets a business owns that, that makes it more advantageous for the buyer? Great question. So there's really four things that buyers look at, whether they intentionally look at or not, they look at them. And this is something that we've seen over the last 15 years and developed really a, a fine-tuned process for it. But we call them the four pillars of value. It's risk, growth, transferability, and documentation. Okay, That's what buyers are going to look at. And there's six different levels to each of those. So when it comes to an FBA business, let's start with the simplest one. Is it transferable? Are you reselling somebody else's product and you've got, a, you've got the rights to sell it online, but they don't want you to transfer those rights? You don't have a sellable business if the assets of the business that drive revenue are not transferable. Most cases, they're sellable. But I've run into situations where you know, uh, one SKU of a, of a, of a you know, brand, let's say, and there was one SKU in there, it was privately branded. The owner had a patent and gave this gentleman, Mike, rights to sell it on Amazon. Mike wanted to sell his um, um, you know, ice injuries. When you get injuries you know, on your wrist, arm, knees, you get ice packs. Um, one of them were, was patented and 50% of his revenue was from that particular SKU. Well, the owner of that patent didn't want to give anyone else the rights to sell it. So Mike had a non-sellable business. Except that, well, no, like I said earlier, everything's sellable. He could have sold it, but only for you know 50% of what it was worth if that other skew was involved. So transferability, really, really important. Going to the end, the last one I mentioned, documentation. If you want to reverse engineer a path to your goal, you have to figure out what the value of your business is today. If you do not have a profit and loss statement with a monthly view, you're not even going to get out of the gate. It's like, you ever see those YouTube videos where people are, um, either mountain biking or racing motorcycles, and they're there at the gate. The gate drops down, and they flop over because they got nowhere. Yeah. You're not going to get out of the gate. You're going to be just like that. So you need to be able to use. You should be using QuickBooks or Zero. Bottom line, those are the two most well known. And ideally, you're using accrual accounting. You're not doing this yourself. You've outsourced it to an e-commerce bookkeeper because that's what they do. You're not using your CPA because your CPA is a tax mitigation specialists and they file your tax returns. Don't let them be your bookkeeper too, because they will just screw it up. So that's documentation. That's the fourth one. The third one is transferability. Number two is growth. So what's going to sway? Assuming that you got three and four nailed, growth, right? If the business is growing year over year, 25, 30, 40, 100%, that's really attractive to buyers. If it's flat or trending down, that's a red flag. And so if your multiple range would be, let's say, three to four times your discretionary earnings and your revenue is flat or down, you're going to be closer to that three. But if you're 25, 30, 40, 50%, you're going to be closer to that four or higher. That one point makes an enormous difference. If you've got $500,000 in discretionary earnings, that means a $500,000 difference in the value of your business. So growth, they love to see growth trends and built-in paths to growth. Meaning, let's say that I have a business where I'm selling computer privacy screens and I have tapped out every possible screen size there is. There's no more growth there. I'm everywhere. You know, the reality is that's not the case. I've got you know, only nine SKUs uh, and four of them were launched in the last six months, and those four already represent 25% of the revenue. That's a clear built-in path to growth. And then on top of that, I've identified 17 more different size monitors that we can create privacy screens for, additional paths to growth. Buyers love that, really, really important. Now, that's really interesting that you say that because that's actually a point that I haven't heard or or discussed in as far as it being uh, a plan for growth, even if you don't have those SKUs secured, but you have the ideas or the ball rolling in that spot. Is that something the buyers look at as well to say, here's the growth plan. Now it's your job to execute that um, yeah. as, as the, we transfer the business. Yeah. So you have a relationship with the manufacturer with somewhere in the world. So if I'm buying your business or if I'm your advisor in the middle of the transaction, I would say, okay, you have nine SKUs now. What additional SKUs does your manufacturer provide that you can brand? Or what, what additional SKUs or upsells do you have planned in the next two or three years? And you detail them. And then I say, can the manufacturer make those? Do they have those already? 
And it gives the, an indication to the buyer how easy or how challenging it's going to be to grow the business beyond where you've got it today. Okay. The other built-in path to growth is that you just, you know, expanded to Germany, uh, right, uh, three months ago, and it's just starting to take hold. Germany's great to sell stuff, the right products in. I shouldn't say every product, but, you know, it's a strong market for Amazon. And if you've just tapped into it, that's another built-in path to growth. You've already set it up. Uh, all we have to do is let it continue to grow, add more SKUs and manage it, right? Built-in paths to growth, they absolutely love. Now, if you go to that first pillar, risk. This is the one that most buyers don't, I mean, most sellers don't get, right? You know your business, you're comfortable with it. It's not risky. You're all right. You got one SKU, it takes four hours a week to manage. It's amazing. You're driving traffic through Facebook ads and then you wind up somehow on your Amazon store. That's an enormous risk, right? Ads get discredited, competition comes in, reviews get hacked. You know, one SKU, is, it's called a hero SKU. That's a huge risk. The higher the risk, the lower the value. The higher the risk, lower the value, lower the multiple. Another risk is age, right? A business that's 12 months old is not as solid or secure as a business that's 36 months old. That 36 month old business probably has more SKUs, more diverse revenue than that single hero SKU. Which one would you rather buy? If I'm making an investment, I want to buy that you know, business that is less risky, more stable, and has all of those growth opportunities as well. So I'm willing to pay a higher multiple for that business. If it's 12, 18 months old, buyers are immediately going to give a discount off the multiple because it's a higher risk business. So the higher the risk, the lower the multiple. Okay. The other is the size of the business. Many novice buyers, Kristen, will say, look, I'm just getting into this. I don't want to risk too much. I'm going to buy a small business. So they want to risk too much dollars, but when they buy a smaller, the smaller business, they're buying a much riskier business, right? If they buy a bigger, a business that is producing $3 million in revenue on an annual basis and $600,000 in discretionary earnings is much less risk than a business doing $300,000 in revenue and $60,000 in discretionary earnings, because that bigger one is much more established. Now, you've got to have the funds to buy that bigger one and the credit to do it if you're going to do it with an SBA loan or some other type of financing. But when it comes to pure risk, the larger, more established businesses are less risky than the younger, smaller, less established businesses. So risk, growth, transferability, and documentation is what buyers look at, and that's going to sway your multiple you know, one way or the other pretty dramatically. I love the these I'm so glad you broke down those pillars because I think that's really important for people to understand that it's not just this is multifaceted and you can have the best SDE for those that don't know that's your seller discretionary earnings that's what your multiplier is based on so um to to bring it even down even farther I mean I understand this but I'm going to I'm explaining it for everybody and of course Joe you can correct me if I I'm, I'm wrong in this area but say you know your your it's not just your profit and loss but what's at, left over after all of your expenses it's basically your owner salary, right? And say let's that's $100,000 a year. Um, those their seller discretionary earnings. Now the multiplier that Joe's talking about here is what your buyer is willing to pay multiplying your seller discretionary earnings. So that's after all of the all your employees that you pay all of your expenses, your taxes, your everything, that would be what your owner salary would be. And then they take that number and multiply it by either two, three, four, um, in order to get what your business, they would offer you for your business. So when he's talking about the multiplier, he's talking about your seller discretionary earnings and how, how much they will multiply that and pay for your business based on these four pillars. So thank you for explaining all of that. I think even that alone is enough for people to be like that. But now I've got questions, right? So you talk about transferability and documentation. So when we're talking about transferability, I, I know that this is kind of a, a, can be a hot topic for some people because um, there's a different opinion, but I, I trust yours because it's not just an opinion. You have so much experience selling these businesses uh, transferability wise. I've heard two things. So, so I want your opinion on that. One, I've heard that um, if the seller or the owner is, is very fully involved and in working in the business on a regular basis, that is not a good thing. And so I, I'm just wondering, is that true or is that not true? It's like, are, are people just buying businesses with, you know, the owner just wants to be passive, if you will, and not really running part of the business. They're really just buying it to, you know, acquire an asset and have everybody else running the business. Or is it really, you know, what, what is the opinion on that? 
Yeah. So uh, again, in 2021, we sold about uh, just under 250 million in total transactions. 30% of those were to aggregators. 70% of those were to mostly buyers that are owner operators and some private equity firms for the eight figure deals. Uh, if we're talking sub $5 million transactions and non aggregator purchases, most of those purchases are going to be bought by owner operators. It's either people that have all the cash or doing it with an SBA loan or combination thereof. And so when we list the business for sale, if you're working less than 40 hours a week as an owner operator of the business, that's all we need. If you're working 70 hours a week as the owner operator of the business, that gets problematic because you talked about seller's discretionary earnings. We, get, we can get really into the weeds. So the seller's discretionary earnings is calculated by net income plus addbacks equals SDE. You mentioned owner salary. If you take a $100,000 payroll a year and your net income is zero, that payroll is an addback. It goes below the net income line after you export it to Excel. Um, if you work 70 hours a week, sorry, you cannot add back 100% of your payroll because the business needs to be bought and positioned so you're working less than 40 hours a week. So you wouldn't add back 100% of that $100,000. You'd add back a, a percentage of it, or you'd, you'd add it all back, but then you'd put an expense in for an additional 30 hours for somebody else to do the work. So my recommendation is don't wait to list your business so that we got to do those adjustments. Get a valuation well in advance of your exit, 12, 24 months in advance, so you can understand these things and put an executive assistant, an EA, a VA, whatever in place at the cost of your choosing in there to do the additional work that you find yourself doing now. Really, really critical that you do that in advance. But um, owner operators find, you know, most of these businesses are owner, you know, single owner operated. If it's being sold to an aggregator or a private equity firm, very, very different. The aggregators, They've built up the staff. They will own it. They'll, they'll operate it themselves. It just gets absorbed. So your job is to help during training and transition, even if you're selling it to somebody that is going to be the owner operator, you're going to, uh, the, the actual asset purchase agreement, Kristen often reads, you're going to uh, stick around for up to 40 hours over a 90 day period after closing. That's called training and transition. And then you go about your merry way. If it's a private equity firm and you're a much larger business, there's all sorts of different deal structures that could occur. But if your goal is to exit fully, um, they may ask you to stick around a little bit longer. Some buyers, like Shaquille Prasla uh, owns uh, SZ Ventures. He's down in Austin. He's got a couple of dozen uh, brands that he's bought over the years. And each time he buys one, he hires a CEO to run it, right? So, when business is being sold, you can't adjust the discretionary earnings to suit everyone. You do an add back for your payroll, assuming it's less than 40 hours a week. And then if a guy like Shaquille needs to do his own adjustments to put a CEO in place to run it, that's on him. The rest of the buyers are probably going to be owner operators and are not going to have an issue with that add back. Awesome. That's super clear. I appreciate that. Okay. Let's talk about these, these other words too, because some people are just completely unfamiliar. Um, aggregator versus a private buyer, things like that. Like what is, what is the difference? Cause I know there's some other brands out there that are just interested in buying brands and not necessarily whole businesses out of that. So um, just explain to us a little bit of the difference between, um, you know, a brokerage, the aggregators, like what, what are the differences sure, here? Sure. Sure. So first of all, when somebody, whether it's an aggregator, private equity firm or private individual that is buying your brand, Let's say that you sell grilling aprons on Amazon um, and it's you know, Kristen's Grilling Aprons. That's the name of the brand. You may have a separate entity that's an S Corp or an LLC that's called Kristen LLC. I'm not buying your entity. I'm buying your brand. So the assets of that brand get moved into my entity and you're left with an empty shell. So that's an asset sale, not a stock sale. Critical difference between the two. So any money you've got left in the bank account, any AR, any AP, it's yours. You don't have to worry about that aspect of it. Now, as far as the buyers, different types, private buyer, individual buyer, it's any Tom, Dick, or Harry that wants to be an online entrepreneur and buys your business. Simple as that. Private equity firm is a company that has raised capital and will buy the business and often you know, keep the owner in place. Or when the business is sold, the owner rolls equity into a new co. So uh, I had a transaction uh, last year where a private equity company bought it. 
and they ended up buying 70% of the assets of the business. Uh, all of the assets rolled into the new company, but the owner, John, stayed on and continued to run the company and rolled 30% equity into the new co. So he's, he's now only a 30% owner, but it's part of a much bigger entity with much greater resources that will help him take that business to a hundred million in revenue instead of the 20 million cap that he could take it to on his own. So eventually he'll, he'll have a much, much larger exit. So private buyer, private equity buyer, individual buyer, private equity buyer. The aggregators are kind of like private equity firms, but they're also operators of the businesses. So you've got Thras, Boosted, Perch, Elevate, and uh, Profound, and you know a hundred others that have jumped on the bandwagon of buying FBA businesses and then operating them on their own. Um, they're uh, scooping them up at you know two, three, four times seller's discretionary earnings. And when it becomes part of their portfolio, they don't own a single brand anymore, right? That's doing a million dollars in revenue. It becomes part of their portfolio. So they own 20 brands that are doing 80 million in revenue. Remember the larger the business, the higher the multiple. So they're buying at two to four times and immediately becomes worth eight to 12 times because it's in a larger portfolio. I see. I totally understand. Thanks for that clarification, because some of us are very new to exiting and thinking about all these language, and that's enough to overwhelm everyone. So you guys have heard it here first that now we have all of these things explained to us. And so, you know, I've got people that have just started their business yesterday and they have people that want to retire next year. And so yeah. we've got everybody from here to there. And a lot of these are, you know, probably under the one million mark when it comes to some of these businesses. So a lot of mm -hmm. people have these questions. Well, what are you know, what? what is the best way to set up my business for an exit you know thinking about transferability so when it comes to transferability are you is there suggestions that you guys would have as far as um, setting up specific video trainings to train a new owner um, to train the people that are doing what you're doing in your business so that that exit is a lot that the transferability is a lot more smooth it's a great question and you know, if you can set all of that up, it would behoove you in two ways. Number one, it's going to instill confidence in your buyer. They're going to trust you and believe in you as an entrepreneur more. That means the deal structure is going to be better, hopefully all cash instead of 80% cash and a 20% seller note. So the more they trust and like you and believe in you and, and what you've built, the better deal structure and the higher value of the company. So that's one reason to set up SOPs. The other is if you get hit by a bus, your spouse can take over or your employee fairly quickly. Or you know, if you just wanna go on vacation and not be bothered by anybody, not check email, SOPs are great. Uh, the second part is that um, during that training and transition period, after closing at up to 40 hours over the first 90 days after closing, those SOPs will make it really easy on you. When I sold my business back in 2010, there were a lot of daily tasks that had to be done. And if that import of X went wrong, then you went to do it this way and you did that. I had it all written out in great detail. It was like a little mini book. And I prepared that in advance because it's one of the things Mark suggested I do. It was a pain in the butt, but after I sold the business, it was a breeze because anything, anytime something went wrong, they first referred, referred to the SOPs. And then, and only then if they couldn't figure it out, they reached out to me and we worked on that up to 40 hours. So I don't think most people are going to do that though, Kristen, to be honest with you, because most entrepreneurs that are just starting out are really just trying to keep the wheels on the bus and stay profitable. So, yeah. you know, that's what I would do in the first six to 12 months of running the business. And then when you're at that 12 month mark, go, all right, I think I might have something that I can sell someday. Let's reverse engineer a path to that. Um, I'm going to set that goal. This is how much I want to sell it for. And then let's figure out what the business is worth and get a full valuation done. And in re that regard, you asked for definitions of private equity, an individual buyer, an aggregator, and broker. I didn't talk about the broker side of it. So it, it, you know, if the majority of people that are listening, watching are FBA business owners, they've probably gotten an email from an aggregator like Thras. Most of these people, the aggregators, are uh, well-educated, charming, likable. They'll heap lots of praise on the brand that you're built in your business and say that they'll buy your business for all cash and close in 30 days. And then they'll slide in there, avoid the broker fee. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? 
Um, I just listened to a podcast by Mike Jackness on Ecom Crew with Bill D'Alessandro, who lives down in Charlotte, runs a company called Elements Brands. He sold a, a $5 million business to an aggregator, and he was so pissed off by the time it was all done. He, he's going on the podcast circuit called the Dirty Tricks po- uh, uh, Aggregators Play, and he goes through like six, of the, six or seven of them that occurred to him in the exit of his business. He didn't sell it for five. It was under contract for 5.2. He didn't sell it for that. And that was part of the dirty tricks that they did. Um, but the the advisor, the broker in the middle, uh, if you've got the right one, they'll do what Mark did for me, which is give you good, solid advice to help build a better business so that you can exit your business for maximum value. Yes, the advisor earns a living if they sell your business and not until they sell your business. And their objective is to sell your business for maximum value. The objective of the aggregators is to buy your business for as little as possible, especially as little cash down as possible. And they will tell you that they're going to buy it for all cash and close in 30 days. Neither of those are true statements for the most part, unless it's like a golden goose of a business. Um, It's going to take longer than 30 days to close because now they have got a whole slew of compliance folks because they've raised a billion dollars to do this. Um, And then they say avoid the broker fee, but what they always look for is two to three worth two to three months worth of inventory for free, Kristen. So imagine that you sell $40,000 a month worth of inventory. They want you to gift them, you know, $120,000 worth of inventory uh, for nothing as part of their working capital peg. And I go through working capital pegs in the book and anytime we list and sell a business, no to working capital pegs. That is not something that is allowed or what we do, unless it's a $25 million business and we're working with a private equity firm. But in the sub-million dollar range, absolutely not. No working capital pegs. You're not giving away any inventory for free. Um, but you know, the, the advisor is somebody that should be in the middle helping you first understand the value of what you have, what levers to push and pull to increase the value of that. And then eventually, when you're ready, exit it for maximum value. Wow. That's really, first of all, disappointing that um, we need to be aware that a lot of these aggregators are out there. As a matter of fact, I, I will, I'm, I'm not mentioning any names, but just last week I had um, a meeting canceled by said aggregator because I asked questions that maybe they didn't know I was prepared to answer. And they're like, I don't think this is a good fit. And they kind of shooed me out the door. So I thought that was interesting that yep. when I kind of, uh, when the rubber met the road, uh, they, I was a little too educated for them and they kind of shooed me off in a different direction. Like, I don't think they were a good fit to work with you. Well, because I, I knew what I was getting into. Yeah, <laughs> and you, so- you were, you were already educated. You've had two valuations with quiet light on other businesses. You understand what's involved and that's a problem for them. They want a huge ignorance discount from you. They don't want you to know what the true value of your business is. You know, I was on a uh, a LinkedIn Live uh, event with uh, the founder of one of the aggregators, and I it was it was it was great of them to invite me on. Right, we have good relationships with them, but they they through the first volley of mud or whatever it was when they say avoid the roker fee. And so on the LinkedIn live event, I said, listen, you guys subscribe to Helium 10 and Jungle Scout, right? And he said, yes, of course we do, Joe. And I said, all right. So therefore, if I was an FBA business owner and I was selling my FBA business to you, my subscription of Helium 10 and Jungle Scout, that cost doesn't carry forward to you. And that's, you know, $150 a month. That's $1,800 a year, the three-time multiple, that's almost $6,000. I can add that back because it's an expense that doesn't carry forward to you, right, John? Yeah, Joe, yeah, that's right. They will never tell you that. And so you talked about seller's discretionary earnings earlier and add backs. You know, I cover 18 different add backs in the book in chapter 11, I think it is. And that alone is worth so much, right? I was at, and again, subtract, add zeros to suit your need, folks, but I was at a, uh, an eight-figure event in October where you had to be doing at least $10 million in revenue to attend, and I'm sitting around a fire pit with somebody that runs uh, a clothing business for events and raves and things of that nature, uh, and they do you know, like $50 million a year in revenue. He had an offer for $10 million for his business, and I said, okay, well, he was asking me about it, and I said, do you do any cashback money or rewards? And he got all excited. And he says, yeah, yeah, we do credit card stacking, Joe. I said, well, what is that? And he says, well, we use one credit card up to the max, and then we switch to the next. So much to the point where my wife and I get $50,000 a month in cashback money. 
And I said, okay, you said your wife and you, so it's not on your P&L. It's over, it could, you know, it's, it's, it's business spending, but it goes to you personally. He goes, yeah. And I said, well, that's okay. Most people do it that way. The IRS hasn't figured out a tax to do it. I said, that's an add back. He said, what's that mean? I said, well, that should be added back to your P&L below the net income line. He goes, well, I get 50,000 a month. I said, I heard you. I said, that's $600,000 a year. And your multiple that you got offered is 10 times. That's $6 million that you should be getting in addition to the value that you've been offered. He bought me the drinks that night and he renegotiated the deal with the buyer and he got an additional $6 million for the business. It's, it's, it's stuff that. So is just like a, he bought you a $6 million of drinks. <laughs> no, no, I wish, right? No, oh, he got a fee for that. <laughs> that's not the case. Um, and that's, look, that's part of, part of what we do. And what I experienced with that first phone call with quiet light is we consider ourselves an education firm first and foremost, and then we happen to do M and a deals as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what I was there for was education and help. But these are the mistakes that people make when they sell their businesses without representation, or at least some education that they can get on their own with the tools and resources that are out there. And I can attest to that. First of all, I'm getting the book. Um, I mean, I have been, you know, a, I, I wish I could say I'm a customer of yours. I'm not exactly a customer yet until I sell that business, right? But um, I have had such a great experience with Quiet Light, not once, but twice, because sometimes we need to meet more than once to make sure we're on track to get to the goal. Because our goal is actually to sell in the next two years. And so that's why we met with you guys. And what that's the most thing I loved about that is that listeners, you have to be able to trust the people that you're working with if it sounds shady, it's probably shady. If someone's being upfront and saying, look, like I've had a couple of business opportunities where I've had someone have to say to me, you're not in a position yet to get the maximum amount for your business. And I appreciated that because the feedback helped me change some things in my business that I needed to change. And that was with my meeting with Quiet Light. And that's one of the reasons why you're here and talking to us like this, because the trust, this is your business. You have, you have, if anybody's like me, I'm emotionally attached to my business in a way that I've spent blood, sweat, and tears. I've sacrificed time with my family to build this business. I've sacrificed a lot to build this business. And so um, it's kind of my baby and I'm eventually going to let it grow up and leave the nest and sell it. And I want to sell it for the maximum value for me. Like you said, at the very beginning of this interview, how do you want to feel when you sell your business? Do you want to feel like some pardon my language here, but there's really no way to say this, but do you really want to feel like someone had you by the balls and you really had no choice in your business? And by the time you got into the weeds with them, they're like, oh, by the way, we bait baited and switched you. And this is not exactly how it's going to go. Or do you want to feel like, wow, these people really helped me understand what I need to change in my business to make it sellable and when I can probably sell it and all of the different, you know, these pillars that you talked about that I can have my duckies in a row. I want to feel great about letting that business go because there's also regardless of what people tell you or don't, and I'm sure you, you have something to say about this, when you sell a business, even if you feel great about it, there's this period of time where you kind of have a big hole in your, whether it's emotionally or wherever else, where you're like, I had to let that go to let something else come in. And so sometimes that transition period, you need to be able to feel really comfortable about handing your baby off to someone else who's going to be able to take care of it, regardless of the check that they wrote you, you still want to be able to feel comfortable and confident confident that what you've built isn't just being, you know, tossed to the wayside. Yes, going into it. But the reality is that when you sell the business, you have a new baby and it's a bunch of dollars in your bank account. Mark Cuban said it best that, you know, that original business that he built that he sold for a billion dollars or whatever it was, that was his baby. And it was really hard to sell it. But then he looked at his bank account. He's like, I have a new baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's one called that, freedom. <laughs> yes. Well, one that is not taxing my brain and making me grind it out every day, trying to stay ahead and order more inventory and deal with exactly. customers and things of that nature. So, but it is important, you know, this, look, I've been through it. I've built, bought and sold a half a dozen of my own companies and through Quiet Light, I've helped hundreds of people exit their businesses. Um, it, it is emotional, as you said. Uh, you know, the, the, the the most important role of and look this whole thing wasn't supposed to be like a pitch for quiet light it's not hire anybody that you feel comfortable with you just said it Kristen you have to trust that person that you're in a relationship with that's going to help you sell your business because it's probably your most valuable asset the the most important job I tell new advisors when they join the team 
and said, look, we can teach you the fundamentals. We can teach you valuations. We can teach you the full admax schedules and how to launch businesses and how to work with buyers and things of this nature. What we can't teach you is how to manage people's emotions and expectations, right? So that's a qualification. That's why we only hire entrepreneurs because they've all been through this already. They've all built, bought, or sold their own online businesses. Some of them have done all three, right? They have to go through that to really understand it because without a doubt, 90% of transactions fall off the rails at some point on the way to closing. And the great brokers get it back on track to closing without any changes. Or if there are changes, it's only done with math and logic, right? None of this stuff that the aggregator pulled with Bill, which is, yeah, no, we're not offering you 5.2, it's 4.6 million, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. We don't agree with all your ad backs, but I have it in writing that you approved all of the ad backs. Yeah, we changed our mind. Yeah. Take it or leave it, 4.6. And he was up against a wall, so we took it, right? right. Um, that's not math and logic, right? And so you really got to work with, we have to work with our clients and really vet the buyers. Bill did that on his own. We've sold several businesses for Bill, but Bill did that on his own. And you get to that point where you've got the experience and you feel like you can do it on your own, but you still get, you know, mm -hmm. You're still, they still have you by the balls, as you just yeah. said, right? Uh, yeah. Because he made the mistake of saying, look, I want to close by December 31st to avoid any potential tax increases. And the yeah. scheduled close was December 10th and multiple offers went away because they locked one in and now they know they've got them by the balls. We got 20 yeah. days. They're not going to be able to find another buyer in that 20 days. It was really unethical and, and whatnot. So managing people's emotions and expectations, these are very emotional processes. You're a week, two weeks away from life-changing money um, for the baby that you built. And you, know, you need somebody on your side that's going to support you and help you through that process. And one more specific question that I really feel like is important is that when you come, when someone comes to quiet light, are you very upfront about telling them, like, you know, we talked about every business is saleable, right? Like for, for the, the right amount for we not, maybe not the amount that you want, but most businesses technically can be sellable for, for what they want. But, um, we actually had someone tell us that our business was not sellable. Um, not too long ago. Of course, I've, I've, tried out a couple of different companies there. And some of them were just for my own, just want to see how their process was. Right. And one of the company basically said, your business is currently not sellable because of these three factors. Um, is that something that quiet light will tell people if, if their business is not in a position at all? Like if someone says my goal is to sell this business in six months, um, you know, as your honest advice could be something like, we don't think that's even possible. And here's why. Um, yeah, yeah, no doubt. Look, we're, we're relentlessly honest. We used to, we used to, the phrase used to be recklessly honest, but we changed it to be more immature. We're relentlessly honest with you. Um, it, it's, if we told you it's not sellable, it's, it's not sellable at your goal, right? Mm -hmm. As I said, everything's sellable, right? You just go sell it for the right price. Um, but we may, in that situation, say, you know, your goal is unattainable. In our view, our opinion, your goal is unattainable. Therefore, we cannot take you on as a client, right? Mm -hmm. We're success-based brokers. We only get paid if the transaction closes. Therefore, we get a little picky. We want to pick the ones that we feel very confident are gonna get all the way through to closing because it's quite the process to get it there. But we'll absolutely tell people, um, your business is not sellable at your goals. In our opinion, you might wanna get another opinion or two. Um, if it's a situation where it's not sellable in its current environment or current state, we'll tell them why. And if it's a situation where it's a great business but it's not sellable by us, then we'll tell them why. And generally that's because they have a brick and mortar presence as well. We don't touch those at all. Awesome. So you guys only deal with online hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. E-commerce, SaaS content, a few service agencies, but mostly those three. Well, I can tell you what, this has just been so informative and so helpful and really eye-opening, I think, not only for myself, but for, for everyone listening who has, you know, there's been a lot of people that have come to me and, and said, you know, I, I have to get out for whatever reason. Maybe they have, you know, a sick child and they have to start taking care of them or maybe aging parents. And they're just like, well, I love my business, but I can't d dedicate it anymore. And it's just going downhill. And is there a way to kind of, should I sell? Can I sell? And, um, you know, for anyone listening out there, if you have a desire to eventually 
eventually exit, which I hope you you do at some point. You don't want to do this until the day you die, eventually retirement or or pivoting or whatever. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to Quiet Light. First of all, they are I agree a hundred percent. I've had multiple interactions with multiple people in your company, and they've all have been exactly what you described just now, relentlessly honest. Um, they were honest with me the first time, they were honest with me the second time, and have nothing but great things to say. And I know that this wasn't just about that, but the reason is because you've educated us on what we need to know, whether or not we choose to come to your company and, and take you up on those things. Yeah. Um, the education is so worth knowing. It actually protected me from an aggregator because I had education from you. So I really appreciate your time and energy into this. And anyone, if you are thinking about it, first of all, I think that Joe has a great offer for us when it comes to his book. Tell us about your book. Yeah. So the book I launched in June of 2021, it hit the bestseller list in seven different categories. It's called the Exitpreneur's Playbook. And it's all of the experience that I've gained uh, from Quiet Light over the last decade, selling hundred million in transactions and helping facilitate another half a billion. So it, it, again, it's not going to get you the black belt. You're not going to be qualified to be a business advisor at this point, but you're going to be a hell of a lot smarter with the tools and re resources and information in the book. So I'm giving it away the digital copy of it. Now you can download this uh, to your Kindle, Nook, iBook, whatever it might be, or just read it as a PDF as well. Uh, but if you go to exitpreneur.io forward slash Amazon files, you can get a free digital copy of the book. If you want paperback, the audible or the hardcover, you can you know go to Amazon and find it there as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, you guys, that, that link will be below um, this video. I'll also be in the show notes for podcast listeners with all of the information to contact Joe, to contact uh, Quiet Light for your personal business evaluation. I highly recommend it. Even if you think that your business is five years or 10 years off, getting that evaluation right now will open your eyes to see number one, where are you? Where do you stand today? And how far is the gap between where you are and where you want to be eventually to sell your business. There's no harm in it. I've done it several times and I absolutely, uh, it really helped me to get my duckies more in a row because I'm a lot closer to selling than maybe some of you are. So um, go to quietlight.com, but also you can, you can reach out to Joe specifically. All the links are going to be below this video, uh, including the link to your free digital copy of the Exitpreneur playbook, which I'm grabbing my copy right away. And you guys, you know exactly how to reach Joe and everyone else using the links, losing the show notes. And guys, one more quick thing. Always have your exit in mind because you just never know what's going to happen. So even if you're not planning on exiting for a while, even if you just started yesterday, starting with the end in mind will really help you continually make business decisions that will point to the end in mind. Because you know, Let's be real. We all don't want to work for the rest of our lives forever all the time. Retirement, whether it's at 50 or 70 or 32, uh, you want to be able to have a plan and be prepared. And this is the best way to get that done. So go to quietlight.com and request your free evaluation and use all the links below this video. Joe, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for writing this book and educating us on exit strategies and all these different plans. And we appreciate you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Kristen. You guys, anytime, any place you could be. I know that you could be listening to any other thing, watching any other thing. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for listening to the Amazon Files podcast. We'll see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.